I'm Jonathan Copel. You're watching Logic and Common Sense. You ever wondered, how do we learn about groomers? Where did the phrase, okay, groomer, even come from? Who's the guy that's been telling us about Marxism in the schools? And do we even have people that are helping us understand what the heck is going on in the United States and across the globe? Yeah, we actually do have some really cool people that are helping us. One of them is Dr. James Lindsay, who is the destroyer of queer theory and other things woke going to have him on in just a second. Like I said, this is Logic and Common Sense, and our show is getting started right now. How do you get canceled? Two genders. Have a sense of morality. Is this real life? I'm Jonathan Copel, and you're listening to Logic and Common Sense. So before I bring on Dr. James Lindsay, the one who is beloved by mothers everywhere for helping them understand who's brainwashing their kids and why and how, I want you to share, like, write a comment, let people know what you're watching because it's very important stuff. So let's bring on my man, Dr. James Lindsay. Hey. Hey, you are hey. here in all your glory. Hey, moms. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it's it's funny because um, you had your, your, your username or something on Twitter recently. It was like lover of moms or beloved by the mothers. Or yeah, whatever. I've had a few of them, you know, like I got accused that some hit piece written about me, like at one point and they said, James Lindsay's just out there getting a million moms. And I was like, I'm getting a billion moms. So it was like James <laughs> Lindsay getting a billion moms. Yeah. Um, when I went to the Moms for Liberty Summit over the summer, uh, I, I changed it like every few hours to something about, you know, being with the moms and, you know, America's top mom, maybe, I don't know. Um, this different stuff. So we've got James Lindsay, beloved by mothers, Nason Wide, the offender of groomers, hmm. cult busting James Lindsay. And then today we just changed your name to, um, I want to say it was top Christian nationalist. Yeah. Well, I actually, it's funny when I got kicked off Twitter back in August, um, there's like this whole Christian nationalist thing happening and like, I, I changed my name to America's top Christian nationalist to kind of like poke fun at the whole thing. Like, cause yeah, I'm a Christian. So let's just poke the bear. And then today, today I get my first hit piece by the Southern poverty law center, the SPLC <sighs> write the hit piece about, I kid you not Christian nationalism. And then they, they obviously just narrow it straight down as one would, if you were the SPLC to white Christian nationalism, talk about how it's been presented in front of house committees in the Congress as a as the rising terrorism threat and then it's linked back to people like myself not a christian and lives a tiktok a jew in order to try to point out how we are feeding a white christian nationalist movement that's going to be violent extremists and so it's only a matter of time till i get listed on their hate list they've done their thing so right now i am james lindsay you know it's at conceptual james as it says i am james lindsay splc's top christian nationalist man um, yeah, he, he just, I'm I guess, having a day. It's a good yeah, day. Yeah, you just, you just roll with it. I love how you just, you know, you try to bring a little humor into all this nonsense. But I wanted to start off our conversation. I'm going to show you some images that are from my community where I live in uh, what's called St. Tammany Parish. And then I want to get into, you know, you've, you've talked a lot about queer theory, the Marxification of education, and, and people changing definitions of words. But let me show you what's happening where I live, and then we'll, we'll dive right in. So... We have a library system and a school system. They're separate. Uh, the schools have their own libraries and we have the public libraries. They have pornographic books that they've made this material available to kids. You've probably seen some of these titles. I am jazz, um, sex, a book for teens, an uncensored guide to your body, sex and safety. This one was talking about having a boy pee on his little girl, um, sticking fingers up buttholes and stuff like that. We've got Lawn Boy by Jonathan Evison and then Gender Queer. This is the, the big displays they put in our libraries. You know, they don't put a big Jesus display. They don't put a crucifix or anything like that. Or, um, you know, I was in there right before Christmas and there was no nativity scene with Mary and Joseph and the wise men. But they definitely make it a point to put on display the whole pride shebang books about being gay, how to be gay. And it's, uh, you know, they put rainbows, they put ribbons, balloons. It's, it's a big deal. You know, they do it in the library. And we have one more. Uh, I don't know if you can see the images in here, but this is from one of the books. You've probably seen this already at some other place. If you've talked with Moms for Liberty, I mean, this book is pretty popular. It's 
uh, boys giving boys blowjobs, telling boys to be gay and to be queer and all this other stuff. And it's in our libraries in St. Tammany Parish. It's in the schools in St. Tammany Parish. It's child pornography, in my opinion. I mean, it's, if, if we're just going to call it what it is, and it's available to kids. So, James, what is this? Why did they put this in the libraries? How did it get there? Why are they doing it? What, what's the end game? I mean, it's there. There are a number of strategic reasons why this is happening, and a number a number of things that can be said. I'll point out, by the way, I say this a lot. Those books that you showed, except for the one with the cows on the cover, yeah. I have seen physical copies of, of three out of the four of them. And I urge people all over the country to do this. I don't care that the author is going to make a little bit of money and you shouldn't either. You should get physical copies of some of these books that are higher profile, gender queer, et cetera. Go through, find the super objectionable material that shouldn't be there. Put a little post-it tab and take the physical, get a backpack or a briefcase or whatever, and take the physical copy of the book. If you're a mom, you probably have a purse. Carry it with you and show people the thing physically. It's horrific to see graphic pictures on the internet. When you physically handle this book and see it and it's real and it, it, it becomes so much more real to you and to whoever you're showing when you show it to them that way. I strongly encourage getting a, getting copies of some of these books and showing people physically, showing them in, in real life what's actually there. Take it to lunch with you, show people. And I've, I've done that. I've seen these books, all of them, like not the cow one, but the other three in person. And it's a very different experience when you do that. So why are they doing this? Well, there's a number of things. One of the things is what we, you mentioned, the Marxification of Education, and that's yeah. the title of my new book. I can hold up a copy of it briefly if people want to see it. Yeah. But, Go get it. Hey. It's it's awesome. It turns out that what these guys, what the guy behind this book, which is Paulo Freire, he's a Brazilian Marxist. Nobody's heard of him. I'm like nobody knows what to do with his name. Freire. It's, it's Brazilian. <laughs> it's Portuguese. Nobody's heard of this guy. But he 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 came up with this concept that's called a generative method of education. The idea is that you present people would be learners with educational or, or sorry, with, 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 with concepts that they're going to want to learn more about that are specifically supposed to be radicalizing concepts. Why is Disney showing kind of groomery movies? Why is, why is this stuff in the library? Because they want the kid to go to the school and ask a question about it. That's one of the reasons mm -hmm. they want the kid to have the idea introduced to them and they want the question to come up. They want the question to come up with teachers so that the teachers can then affirm it and take it in one direction. They want the question to come up with parents so that parents will then look like the bad guy. They will, This is part of the purpose is to generate the concept. When we look at the paper that they wrote explaining why Drag Queen Story Hour, they wrote a paper, an academic paper in a major curriculum journal explaining this. They say because it's a generative opportunity for kids to learn to live and be queer. The goal is explicitly to groom kids into queer ways of living and being. They say so themselves. They say it's not even about empathy. It's about that. Wow. So that's one thing. They say in that paper that it's a provocation for the children. But it's not just a provocation for the children to do that generative education. It's also a provocation for the parents. It's to make people mad. Why is it stuck in your face everywhere? Well, first of all, it's their religion and they don't know how to do anything else. <laughs> Second of all... It makes people mad. It makes people scared. It makes people desperate. It makes people want something to be done. And then when they try to get something done, nothing can happen. You, you go talk to the library. They won't take it down. Mm -hmm. You don't understand probably that the American Library Association has a lot to do with that. And it's completely Marxist and has been yeah. for a while. Uh, but you go, nothing happens. You get frustrated. And they're counting on a moment where some right wing person does something stupid. Mm. Some right winger decides they're going to protect kids. They're going to, and I get the impulse, and they're going to take it into their own hands. And then it's going to be drag Floyd, just like we had George Floyd in 2020. <laughs> I said that on stage at Turning Point uh, when I was on on Tim Cast with Steve yeah. Bannon and then Charlie. Drag and Media Floyd. Matters had an article about it before we got off the stage. That's how scared they are of that idea being exposed. They want to drag Floyd. They want somebody to go do something stupid to a drag queen or to a, a trans person or something. And wow. then gin up the, the the narrative of violence. You hear it already. Stochastic terrorism, rising anti-LGBTQ hate. You know, this article about white Christian nationalism in the SPLC this morning about me and lives a TikTok or somehow loops in me and lives a TikTok about the groomer thing because yeah. they think that we're laying down narratives that are going to be used to justify violence. 
And so you can see that the, it's a deliberate provocation and it keeps escalating. It goes from these books to drag queens reading books to drag queens dressed very provocatively to drag queens doing sexual dance, to drag queens doing simulated sex acts, to drag queens showing up. We've all seen the images now of the one that actually was in here. You say that's down the street from you. It was down the street from me here in East Tennessee. <laughs> That's where terrible. it's wearing like some kind of a box. Oh, with the boobs. Breasts, with, the, yeah. with, fake with the fake boobs, plastic fake boobs ones. that are bare yeah. inside the box. This is an wow. escalating provocation. So there are kind of three main points then. One is the generative opportunity to groom kids, to get the kids to be interested, to bring it up, to start talking to them about gender bending ideas, to separate them from their parents. Second is a provocation to shock the kids into being interested about it, to shock the kids out of their sensibilities. And the third is a provocation, oh, sorry, the, the provocation also to the society to try to provoke violence. And the third is that, like I said, it's just their religion. This is their religion. Yeah. Um, it's queer Gnosticism is what it actually is. And so I agree with you with the religion part. And I always find it strange because years ago they removed, say, the Ten Commandments from school, uh, prayer from schools and the public school systems. But now it's been replaced with this gender, queer, gay rainbows. And I mean, it's it's a cult religion. And these it is a cult religion. These, these teachers promote it and these librarians promote it and these different figures and activists promote it. They're evangelizing for the, the, I don't even know what to call it because you say LGBTQ, but every five minutes there's a new letter or a new number or a new symbol. I can't keep up with it, but they are promoting it like uh, an evangelist would promote the gospel or a missionary from years ago when they were doing crusades and stuff. It's almost like we have uh, gay crusaders. That's the modern thing now. That's what we have in the schools. I mean, look at it. They put the flags on literally everything. We had the government putting up the flags. We had Air Force cadets running with the flags. Like these are all things. This is what colonizing entities, colonizing nations. Yes. Do. This is a colonization. And when you say that it's a religion, though, or when we say it's a religion and a cult religion, it is. And again, I emphasize I can name which religion it is. I can tell you how it works. It is queer Gnosticism. It is the belief that the bodies that we were born in are a prison that we were flung into without our, our, our knowledge and that, or without our consent. And that if we transcend that, the doctor assigned us sex at birth, the social constructions of gender made us stay that way. If we can understand that we have a true sexual identity outside of the confines of that a sex assignment at birth, and that social social construction of and socialization into gender roles, then we can we can escape the prison of the beingness in our own body. It's a cult religion. So when they use words, they say, "What is drag queen story hour?" In that paper, for example, I could read it to you directly. They call it a preparatory introduction to alternate modes of kinship. And everybody focuses on the alternate modes of kinship for the obvious reason. That's like holy shit. That's actually grooming, <laughs> but. If you stop, and I, I hesitated, I, I said it very distinctly, preparatory introduction, that means cult initiation uh -huh. is what that means. It is a cult initiation. Why are these books here? As a cult initiation. Why is it a provocation? As a cult initiation. That's what it is. And they're going to catch some of the kids. And they're not going to catch all the kids. But once you start getting somebody to get pulled into a cult, whether it's Scientology, whether it's a weird Christian cult, whether it's like uh -huh. Jim Jones, it doesn't matter what it is. Once you get somebody pulled into a cult, what do they do? They start separating from their families. They yep. get love bombed and affirmed in the cult. They get told that people outside of the cult are dangerous, that they're going to har be harmful to them, et cetera, et cetera. And you see exactly that dynamic of setting up the parent as the person who doesn't get it and is right. bad. And the the groomers at the schools as being the facilitators into this, it, this is a this is cult instruction. This is it's not even like. It's not even religious. It's beyond religious in terms of how egregious it is and how much it doesn't belong in our schools. Yeah, it's it's pretty gross. But I think a lot of people aren't seeing the bigger picture. We have um, like dictionary.com a couple of years ago changed the definitions for about 15,000 words. Right. They changed about 15,000 definitions because they want to be more inclusive. They don't want to be prejudiced. So we are our, our definitions are being changed. I mean, they can't even define what a woman is. We don't know anymore. That's a recent one. They're, they've updated on all the different sites. Yeah. I still have a, a Webster's College Dictionary from years ago. It's printed on paper. That's yeah, when, one right here. Actually, yeah, right there. The, there it is. Tenth, <laughs> Collegiate Dictionary, 10th edition. I mean, look, years ago that was. The, the pterodactyls were flying around, but hey, at least the dictionary had accurate um, definitions. Now yeah. on the internet, you can't trust anything. But Did changing. you see the one the other day with that? 
which, with the which Cambridge, the, the Cambridge. So Cambridge, you know, famously not important college, Cambridge, <laughs> right? <laughs> so the Cambridge Dictionary updated the definition of female. It still says oh, the actual yeah. definition of female, and the definition is still unobjectionable. But they added a warning label to the definition. Outside of the sciences, most people find this definition offensive. Most people, <sighs> most fake. people. It's and again, fake. people are like, most, most? No, 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 no. The word that matters here is people, not most. They don't count you as a person if you don't agree with them. And then when you start realizing, you know, what's the justification for abortion? What's the justification mm -hmm. for uh, euthanasia is, well, your personhood expired or your personhood hasn't arrived yet. If they can say that you're not a person because you don't agree, it's yeah. not most people. And most is the actionable word. Most people find this. No, no, no. Most people who count as people is how that should be read. Wow. Don't uh, would find this offensive. Yeah. And so you have to like, this is a fundamentally dehumanizing cult. The people in the cult count the people outside of the cult don't count as even being people. And it's there in their language when you understand how to read it. And then I say these things and people are like, Oh, James is reading that into it. He's insane. I'm like, all right, no, just no. go read Lenin. That's he said the same yeah. stuff explicitly. Man, it, it's insane. I just, I love the way you, I, I feel like you, you study this all day and, and write about it and, and read about it. So you, you, therefore you are an expert on the topic. So I'm so glad you, you share what you share, but um, I, I want to ask you one, one question. This is a big one. Cause I heard from a lady today at an anti-groomer gathering that I went to where it was a bunch of grandmas and moms and a yeah. few guys, a few dads were in there or granddads. And you know, we have these books in our libraries, we have these books in our schools, and it's pictures of kids giving blowjobs to other kids or pictures of kids sticking their finger up at other kids. But if me as a man, if I go into the street with that book and I show it to a kid walking down the street, I'm going to jail. Like I mm -hmm. will go to jail. I will be a pedophile. That's what I would be labeled if that situation happened in the street. But if I show that same book in a school, it's protected. There's no consequence. The rules don't apply. Why is that? I mean, what do you think? Like, why are these school teachers and these librarians, why are they a protected class? Um, that's actually a really good question. But I think it's because our colleges of education and thus the school administrators have been asleep at the wheel for, or, sorry, have been indoctrinated in this for a very long time. And our society's basically gone asleep at the wheel. Like, there was just a court case that got decided in Massachusetts, I saw today, where they, there was something about, um, this kind of trans issue and it came before a judge and the judge dismissed it because it says it doesn't shock the conscience. Hmm. Like it doesn't. So it's been normalized, whether through entertainment, through generation of education, through the increasing escalation. Like I have no problem and have never had any problem if people want to have a pride parade or whatever in mm -hmm. June or whatever they want to do. Mm -hmm. But what does it turn into? Like, well, fetish should be at pride. No, it shouldn't. No, we're going to keep as like you want to go out and celebrate who you happen to be. It's a little strange, but fine. I get it. There's been years of, you know, there's been years of, of discrimination and all of this. I get it. Fine. And I've been in trouble for this particular discussion for a long time. And being proud of who you happen to be, like, really get a job, do something, be proud right. of. But yeah. um, like, that's not that interesting. But um, fetish, we're going to bring fetish into it. We're going to bring sexuality into it. We're going to pup fetish in front of children like no 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 no. this is an intentional escalation to where when it gets up in front of the judge when this question comes well why are we doing this in schools is because well it doesn't shock the conscience this mm -hmm. is just something we do and apparently in a completely healthy society and so this is how they're able to wow. get this pass and the schools the the education system has been like you can picture it like, you know, they bit the hook and it's got this heavy sinker that's been dragging them down into the abyss for like 30 years now, literally 30 years um, on these topics. So they're not equipped to be able to see what they're doing and how wrong it is any longer. Uh, it's very frustrating for, you know, your average person. And you're right. Like the only episode of YouTube, the only episode of my podcast that ever got demonetized, I even had one about the vaccine that didn't get demonetized. The only one that ever got demonetized was one where I read excerpts out of genderqueer, where I read like, oh yeah, we're going to taste each other. Have you, it, there's actually a quote in there. Have you ever tasted your vagina slime? That's in the book. Wait, that's uh, that's this one on the right. That's right. Queer. Yeah. I haven't only read one. that, but they got these women. It's, it's, it's incredible, right? These local moms... They go find this stuff. They say, hey, this is in the school. This is in the library. And they print, you know, four by eight 
cop, like massive four foot by eight foot or whatever, giant printouts of pages of these books. And it's, it's disgusting. It's absolutely yeah. And disgusting. what happens? You show up to the school board to show it to them or you read it to them at the school board and they say that's not appropriate for the yeah. school board. There are children present. You need Correct. to stop. Or yeah. you put it on YouTube and it demonetizes your video for being adult content. Or people put it on their Twitter accounts and their Twitter accounts got, I, I know people like Chris Elston, for example, so-called Billboard wow. Chris and others who put images out of that book. On, I got kicked off of Instagram for a while for images out of that book. I know people on Twitter who got their accounts blacklisted as pornography accounts for putting pictures out of that book. Wow. They literally, I had to delete tweets for adult content, but they had the adult content. Like if you were a porn star and made your porn star account that does porn on the freaking thing and you get that label on your account and can't get rid of it, they got that stuck on them. So you don't show up in searches. Yeah. If like, this is how bad it is. Um, if, if you find, you know, there's obviously copious numbers of, of parody account or, or spam accounts or whatever that that catfish off of porn stars. Yeah. So let's say you were going to go report one on Twitter. I actually tried this to find out if it's true. So I went, I found one and it's so-and-so, you know, 063 or whatever. And it's like a fake, obviously, right? right. So I, it sent me a random DM and I was like, I'm going to report this and see what happens. And you type in the entire, it says, well, who is it impersonating, right? And you mm -hmm. type in the entire name of the person. It doesn't populate. You can't actually even report an impersonator for somebody that gets the adult content label wow. slapped on their Twitter. And so these are normal parents getting the adult content label slapped on their their account because they shared images. So this is the state of what's in those books that if you tried it, you can't read it. You can't put it on TV. You can't get monetized on a YouTube. You can't anything with these books, but they have to be in the schools. Why? Because the ALA is marxist they can't be removed from the schools why because the right wants to burn books and it's anti-lgbtq hate these mm -hmm. are the terms that this movement is trying to set for us and this is the fight that we have to have and like i mentioned before with drag floyd we have to fight smart we have to fight legal it's grueling it's grinding it takes a long time it's frustrating and we have to keep pointing it out keep bringing it up because what's happened, we, we all know Uncle Yuri, right? Yuri Brez, Bezdemov or whatever, the KGB guy that did the video back in the 80s. And he was like, yeah, so we come and we demoralize you. And like people, you show them facts. They won't believe you. They won't believe you until the Soviet boot is on their neck, you know? And it's like, yeah, that judge in Massachusetts demoralized. He's also an Obama point, appointee, but I digress. But um, these people are demoralized. It doesn't shock the conscience that we have people depicting things to children and affirming them to the point where a somebody under the age of 15 wants to cut their genitals off. That doesn't shock your conscience. You're demoralized. You have lost your, a huge piece of your soul. You don't even know who you are anymore. And we have to drag as many people, especially people like judges and lawyers and politicians. We have to drag these people kicking and screaming out of demoralization and back into reality. Wow. And the only way to do it is to keep showing them and keep making the point and keep, that's why I tell people, buy a physical copy of the book and show it to people. It is not enough even to just talk about it. Just buy a copy, take it with you, show it to people. It's literally shocking when you, it does shock the conscience, conscience to see it in person. That's sick, man. These people, to me, these people are sick and disgusting. I mean, I saw the Ted talk. It was about, um, you know, why pedophiles are just regular people because they're minor attracted persons. It, this is just becoming more and more disgusting and getting worse and worse and worse. So people don't start dragging the politicians, like you said, and dragging decision makers into this fight to do something about it. Uh, I, I would say in the next 10 to 15 years, you might see where uh, no longer will somebody be labeled as a sex offender if they have sex with a minor, or if, if they I mean, rape they go, a minor. Yeah, they're, they're going after that. And there's this queer theory. I'm trying to get people to recognize that there's this thing called queer theory that literally got named in 1990, I think one, maybe three by Teresa De Laurentiis. Like we can literally tell you who named it. Mm -hmm. And its first paper, official paper was in 1984 by a woman named Gail Rubin. I read the entire paper as a three part series podcast on my platform, New Discourses. All the way, and it, it really comes out of the work of the French postmodernist, mm -hmm. Michel Foucault, who advocated for the uh, abolition of child 
or, of, of uh, age of consent laws, um, signed a petition for them, a very famous petition, along with a lot of these other people um, that are in these kind of leftist milieus. And from the very beginning, though, we go to Gail Rubin's first queer theory paper, which is called Thinking Sex, published in 1984. What does she complain about? What does she say are the problems that are motivating to write this? Well, that man boy love is discouraged. Nobody will stand up for the boy lover, she says. Nobody. They're so discriminated against. That's 1984 she's arguing this. She says that fetish people shouldn't be discriminated against, so they should be able to wear their fetish gear to work. And we see Sam Brinton stealing luggage so and cool. dressing like that in the White House. And that weird like PR thing they put out with the weird guy with the fingernails and the dress that turned into a meme. Yeah, they should be able to wear it to the that guy to work. No, the other guy, the oh, one that okay, was on sorry. the cell phone, and they made their little video with Jim wrong Snacky guy or whatever. Wrong guy. Wrong well, guy. the point is that there's a bunch of them. Yeah. And so, what else does she complain about? That that child pornography was being criminalized in the mid 1980s. That shouldn't be happening. That's what she says. So we have boy love. We have what she calls cross generational sexual relationships. Those shouldn't be stigmatized. People should be able to wear their fetish gear to work and not face consequences. That's what she's complaining about. And this is part and parcel with the whole program of queer theory. And queer theory right. has a long, that's 1984, so you can do the math and figure out that that's 30, almost nine years ago now, 38 years ago. This is a long history, and that Michel Foucault's work goes back 30 years before that. This is a long, profound history that can be read. It can be comprehended. Its goals, its trajectories, its aspirations can be understood. And you can... We could, just like we did with critical race theory, where we got a grasp on it, people started to read it, and they were able to see what it is and understand what it is and point it out. Queer theory is the same thing, and it has to be attacked the same way. It's not the same thing, actually. It's much worse. It's way uh, worse. Well, the, the thing I, I, I think about is, uh, and you've said it before, th there's a, a force in America that could shut this down like overnight. It's the church, like the corporate church, Christian church, in my opinion. Uh, I think I think you've said this before. But what do you think about morality in America and the churches? Do they could they stop this if they got involved, the corporate church in America? It could be a significant. I mean, it's the biggest bulwark against this kind of thing that you you could possibly have if they could do it smartly. If they come out and they start kind of like Bible beating, most right. Americans, I think, are still turned off by Bible, Bible beating. And it, I think a lot of younger Americans are turned off by Bible beating. And they're, so they kind of fall into a trap of irrelevancy. But if they came out and actually spoke very plainly and very clearly about morality and, and that this is uh, clearly, you know, not what we should be doing with our children. I think that they could be an enormous force. The amount of resources that they have, the amount of ability to organize people. But the problem is, is these entities are also infected. They're badly infected. We have the Methodist church was like proudly celebrating services performed by drag queans just yeah. within the last couple of months. This is yeah. the whole church. Pride churches, <laughs> drag queen churches. Like, so a lot of people are like, they come to me and they're like, well, the church is going to save the day. And I'm like, you know, I go full Jordan Peterson on them. I'm like, clean your room. Like you can't wow. even fix a denomination. What the hell are you talking about? Yeah. You can't even fix a single denomination, much less. But if they would get involved and they would would stand for what's right and not get too preachy about it. And I understand it's very important for Christians to be preachy, but it's like the Great Commission. I get it. I'm not going to like, like good for you guys, but it turns a lot of people off. So it's very important to understand. And I know their attitude is like, well, it's a, Jesus came to bring a sword. I get it. Like, yes, I know. I read the book. The point is we are in a really desperate moment and just being like paragons of, of, you know, basic virtue and saying, you know, we're Christian. These are our beliefs. If you want to join in, great. If you don't, we still think they're right. And we hope that you understand what we're saying. They could be, they could mobilize massive amounts of resources. But the problem is, with large bags of cash often obscuring their view, they're often complicit instead, which is extraordinarily sad. I mean, I've read books like Matthew 4, which talks about large bags of cash, <laughs> sort of. That's where Jesus is tempted by Satan. I know, I guess there's not technically a large large bag of cash. It's, yeah, it's a little different. But you would think that more pastors would be familiar with what these temptations look like as they've preached on Matthew 4 probably multiple times. I've read Jeremiah 23. I've read Ezekiel 30. Which one is it? Where you're talking about the false teachers and how they're pursuing their own interests and they don't take care of the flock and they damage. I've read these things and I look and I'm like, man, like, 
Could you imagine how frustrated the people writing the Bible had to be with their people? Like, holy shit. <laughs> imagine, imagine those same writers today. And that that is something I don't think the average churchgoer or average minister even. Oh, my God. Watched. They would facepalm so hard they'd give themselves a concussion, first of all. I think they'd be cutting ears off like Peter did when they came to arrest Jesus, honestly. Just slice yeah. it, slice it. Because it, it's, it's so bad today that it's sick. I, I hate it. James, um, I appreciate you sharing all your views. I, I love hearing from you. It was awesome seeing you at AmFest. Any, yeah. last, any last words that you can offend people with or encourage people with? I mean, we should be encouraged. We actually should be. Um, I don't know if you know who, who Bob McEwen is, but I'm kind of proud to be able to call him a friend of mine. He's a former congressman. He actually like showed up to like end communism in Soviet Russia in like the 80, late 80s and early 90s. Like he was there. He's the real deal. And he gave a talk I was at recently. I listened to him talk and he was like, we're three fourths of the way to Berlin. Don't give up. Yeah. World War II, go read your World War II history. You don't have to get deep. It was getting bad. It was getting real ugly. The Americans got involved really late. And then the march from Normandy to Berlin is shocking. Like we think, oh, World War II, like 1938 to 1945, that's like seven years or whatever. No, no, no. The Americans got him. Like we sat on our, our hands for a long time. Like, and we were, were, were the darkest hours looked are, are right there when you think we're not going to make it. But as, as Bob said, we're three quarters of the way to Berlin. Stop eating black pills. We are turning the tide on this. People are waking up in droves. We're not going to win every legal thing, especially at first. We're not going to win right. every cultural fight, especially this early on. But in two or three years, as somebody who's been screaming about this now for getting close to eight, um, I can tell you the, the overwhelming change. So be encouraged, take heart. We're three quarters of the way to Berlin. And when we get there, the war is going to have a very different uh, shape to it. I mean, for, for instance, the World Economic Forum left Twitter. <laughs> they're out. They don't they're like they're like, nope, we have to only go where there's proper censorship. And the, so things are there are so many pieces of good news tucked within, you know, a gigantic storm cloud of bad news. Uh, keep your heart, keep your faith, keep pushing. And uh, we, we can do something good here. We will do something good here. Man, that's awesome. James, it's been a pleasure. I'm so glad you came uh, on my live stream, on my show, Logic and Common Sense. I'll probably see you around at the next giant political conservative <laughs> yeah. gathering at some point. So take care, man. I will see you around. Yep. Good to see you. And thanks for watching, everybody. This has been another awesome episode of Logic and Common Sense. Like, share, leave a comment, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.